Welcome back to my channel. I'm Brian Kafke, and I'm continuing this series on Master Databricks and Open Source Apache Spark. We're continuing with Lesson 16, SQL, better known as Structured Query Language, and we're going to talk specifically about how to use window functions, which are a really powerful extension to the SQL language. And I'll be talking through the concepts, but using examples on Databricks, which is indicated by the Databricks icon underneath the Les Lesson 16 title. So let's jump in. What are Windows functions, you may be asking? Windows functions, and I copied this link off a page. I put the link there off of an Apache drill site because I like the way it explained it. They operate on a set of rows and return a single value for each row from the underlying query. The term window describes the set of rows in which the function operates, hence the name, and a window function uses values from rows in a window to calculate the returned values. If you're familiar with SQL in general databases, like relational databases, like SQL Server Oracle, then you may be familiar with the idea of sort of a cursor. And part of this seems a little reminiscent to me of cursors. If you think of you getting a result set back, Within the result set, you define a sort of window or overlay, if you will, like a template that blocks off a set of rows. And then you can kind of move around and, and access different parts of it without it really affecting the outer query. So that's kind of the power of window functions. As I mentioned, they are an extension to the original SQL standard to allow greater functionality than had previously been possible. A little more detail on what I mean by window functions. They perform a calculation across a set of rows that are somehow related to the current row. And they are similar to aggregate functions, with the exception that aggregate functions consolidate rows. You may have 20 rows in a uh, aggregate function query where you're summarizing, getting total sales, and you'll get only one row back based on the grouping. But that's not how the window functions work. So although they do have a grouping operator, we'll see called a partition, they're actually different in that they're not going to consolidate the result rows back. <clears throat> the window function is able to access more than just the current row of the query result. We're going to see it. It kind of mentioned that's where it kind of reminds me of a little cursor. You can pop around and access parts of the query result. In this notebook, which I will include in GitHub, and I'm, there should be a link in the description for this video, which will allow you to go to GitHub and get the slides, not many admittedly, as well as the code from this notebook. Now, I put lots of links in these things because I know when I'm looking through code, I start to get curious or I want a better explanation of how things work. So you can find in here a bunch of ones, a, a full description of the documentation on Apache Spark SQL, uh, some specific, a link here to specific documentation on window functions, and then here, uh, another link that has some additional information I thought was pretty good and useful. Uh, another one here, I think that's a blog, or it's actually Apache Spark, more details. So take a look at those. I think those help give you more details. There's enough material around window functions and things you could do that it can really become a pretty large topic in its own right. So I'll point you to these links and look into them more. The most important takeaway is you have in the back of your mind a tool set in which these window functions can be used. That's what I try to do. Remember, oh yeah, this type of function may help do what I want to do, as opposed to not knowing about it and then reinventing the wheel by writing some very complicated SQL. So let's look at some key terms here. A really important term is the over word. The over keyword marks this as a window function. All right, so you're going to see code in this a bunch of clauses and things around it. But when you see the over keyword in SQL, you know you're dealing with a window function. The next one that's really important is partition. Now, partition is very similar to the group by clause that you see in standard SQL. But it is operating within a subset of data within the window function. So the partition is a group by for the window function. The other thing to bear in mind with it is that not going to consolidate rows from the outer query. The idea is for it to control how the window function will work and what is the frame on which it will work. I kind of think of a partition as a little more like if you if you go way back like I do, we used to have in reporting something called a control break. 
So you might have a report of employees listed by department. And then when the department code changes, you do a control break, you spit out a total, and then you go to the next department. And that's a little bit how I think partitions work. So maybe that'll help you. Within that grouping, you may want to also sort the data. Now this can be a little confusing because unlike partition, which is different as a word than you get in the outer SQL query, order by is the same syntax that you would use if it was just a standard SQL query, order by sorts. But this order by is, again, contextualized within the window function. So we're going to see lots of examples. So don't worry if it's not all making sense yet. I think the rubber hits the road when you see the code. I'll put a link in the description also for, I believe it was video 10, in which I walk through the external file CVSV files that we use to create tables in a database we called AW Project. So if you haven't done that, you won't be able to run the code in this notebook, but you can follow along, but you may want to go back and do that if you haven't already. So I'm going to run use AW Project, and that's just going to change the context of the database to AW Project so we can access all the tables we created in there. I'm also going to do something else, which is I'm going to create a couple of views to simplify the code in a window function so that we can focus on that rather than adding unnecessary complications to the code. So I'm going to create a view here called B underscore sales summary, and I'm just going to get the sales year, sales month, and then sales total, and I'm going to be grouping it, not surprisingly, by those columns, year and month. And I'll just run that, and I already ran this, so I'm just going to leave that in place. And you can see here we have what we wanted here. It's year, month, and sales total. I limited this output to two just to give you an idea what that looks like. So it's a very, very simple view. If you don't remember what views are, they can be treated just like tables, but every time you query a view, it's going to run the query behind the view. So it's like a named query that you can treat like a table. So if you don't know much about views, put a comment in the description. I can do a whole thing on those if we like. Create or replace view. Another one is the AdventureWorks data warehouse is a great example of how not to do a data warehouse. It isn't properly dimensionally modeled. It generally really isn't following a star schema. The worst area where it's snowflakes, and by the way, regardless of the popular product, snowflaking is not a good practice. It means when you create multiple tables to represent a dimension and you have to join between those dimension tables to get results back. And this is a great example of doing that because we have a dim product table. Then we have to go to another table to get the product subcategory. And then we have to go to another table just to get the category. So rather than do that, I'm creating a nice little simple view, V underscore product catalog. And I created it already and I ran this query so you can see. And all it is is the category, then the product, and total sales amount. And you can see here we just rounded that up, total sales amount. Again, give us a nice simple data set to work with. But it's a view just so that we have some flexibility. All right, so let's start. What's the goal of the first example? We want to get the results, a detailed set of results, but we want to do a cumulative total within each group. So if we look at this example, 2011 first month, total sales is here. And not surprisingly, the cumulative sales at this point is also the same number. But the second month, we have the sales amount, the detail amount, or total sales detail, if we get will. But this is the sum of the prior month plus this to give us this. And then we get this month's sales. And then we get the total, which arguably you could say it's all these two. Or you could just say it's, it keeps adding the total onto this cumulative. So it keeps adding on that. And then we get another amount. And if you think of this being added to, then we get this. And so and so on and on until we get here. Now at this moment, this cumulative summary is the total sales amount for the year because it's the total for each month added up. I mentioned this is like a control break. When we get to the next year, because remember we're grouping on partition by sales year, here it resets itself. And then we get the first month of sales for that sales year. And then it starts the cumulative total all over again. So that's the control break after that. Clear everything, reset, continue on. Here our goal is to get the results with a cumulative average as opposed to a total. But we're going to do something very strange. We're going to do one row before and one row after the current row. Now, before we go in here, 
I want to explain a little bit about that. So one of the concepts within a window function is the idea of a partition and an idea of a frame. So you'll hear that, you'll say, what's, uh, there's a frame related to a window function. And that means if I look over here, we can see the partition, right? And this represents a set of rows. And what the partition, remember that's a group by. So it might be this is a department, all the rows within a department within our data set. Or it might be, as we just did, a sales year, right? And all the rows in there. Now we have a default setting, but we can go all the way up to the first row within the partition, all the way to the last row within the partition. And that's called unbounded preceding and unbounded following. We also have more granular control though. We can say we wanna go up n rows or go down m rows and have more granular control about how we wanna do this. And I use this link below, which is in there, so you can go back to this. It doesn't fit Spark SQL, but I like the description. It's actually from SQLite. It's a SQLite tutorial that has a nice explanation of this. So we have unbounded preceding, which means that the frame starts at the first row of the beginning of the partition. End row preceding, you can actually say how far back do you want to go, how many rows. We have the current row is the current row that we're sitting at. So again, think of this. This reminds me a lot of Power BI. It's the current row context kind of thing. Where are we right now? That's the idea. We're sitting on a current row and then we're doing things with other rows. And we can also see the unbounded following, which is the final row, the last row right down here of the partition. And then, or we can be more granular and say n rows. So we have this kind of level of granularity. The default settings is here, which is a range between unbounded preceding and the current row. So that's the default. When you want to specify the number of rows, as we are showing here, you don't use range, you use rows, and you specify the offset of the current row in the frame. We're going to see that now. So again, our goal is to get the cumulative average, but using only one row before and one row after. We're not really doing a cumulative average. We're doing a three row cumulative average. What do I mean? What I mean is we want to do an average, but we're only going to be looking one row back, one row ahead and then the current row and we're going to say what's the average of those three next to each individual detail let's take a look at the output then we'll walk through the code so in the first case we have 2011 and the sales month one now i decided to use the sales month which is an integer in this rather than something like sales because using the small numbers it's a lot easier to see what's really happening mathematically but you would probably use this really with something like a sales month so here we have the first row. Now we can't really go back to the a prior row. So the first row is going to say, look at the second row, two, add that to the first row and get a total of three, divide it by two, since that's how many rows you have, and your average is 1.5. The next time you're gonna say, okay, I've got two. Add to two the previous value, sales month one, so now we got three, then add the next row, three. And then divide that by the number of occurrences, which is three, and we get an average of two. Now, because it's whole numbers and it increments sequentially, it kind of maps out all the way till we get to the last month we say 12, and then 12 we're gonna go back and say average in 11, but we don't have a next row to look at, and we end up with the 11 and a half. So hopefully it's pretty clear, it's a very simple example. The next one is going to be an example of goal is getting the top two selling products by product category. And this is where I really needed to create that view for products because it's a mess trying to join all those tables and I don't want to distract what we're doing here. Let's take a look. We're going to say select category product and sales amount. And then we got this thing called rank. Where is rank coming from, Brian? Well, let's take a look. We're going to say from. Now, I don't do this a lot. I use common table expressions. This is, remove the word common, it's just a table expression. Instead of just giving it a table name, I can actually substitute a query. Pretty powerful, good to use in limited occasions, but be careful because if you do too much of this, queries can become pretty unreadable pretty quickly. But I'm doing that here, I'm using a table expression. And in this table expression, I'm just running a query. So we can look at this entire thing as just a query. We're picking category, product, and sales amount. And now we're doing something here, dense rank. Hmm, interesting, it's a function. But that function is gonna require the over, a window function to run, right? We're gonna get over. We're going to partition by category 
order it by sales amount descending. Why are we doing it descending, Brian? Why do we have to add that? The short DESC is just short for descending because we want to get the highest, uh, the highest selling products, the highest sales amount, right? This is all totaled already. In order to do that, we don't want to do ascending, which is the default. We have to do descending. So the largest numbers are at the top. So that's the idea here. So we're going to be doing ranking over category. So that's our grouping. And then within that, we're going to be doing an order by high to low and returning it as rank. And that's going to be returned as itself, basically just like as if it were a table, the results from that. Because we did it as a table function, we can now access this returned rank, which came from here, right? And we can say, only give it back to us where the rank is less than or equal to two. So that's the idea. And we can see now we've got this nice thing, each category and the top two, the, the ones that ranked in the top two. If we didn't do this as a table function, in fact, if we just ran this by itself, what we'd really be getting is all of the products ranked, all of the, all of the by category, all the products ranked, which could be any number and much harder to look at. And maybe all you're really interested in is the top two products. Now I'm going to show you a slightly different way to do that query because as you know, or you may know, I'm not a big fan of table expressions, but I like common table expressions. So I just removed that query that was above in the table expression and I created it as a CTE, common table expression. And now I can run the same query and treat the results of this query as, a, as if it were a table. And then I can just say where rank is less than or equal to two because this is going to be returned very much as if it was a table and I can treat it that way. Let's look at another example. Get the lowest and highest sales amount for each customer displayed next to each sale for the customer. So we want to get the highest and lowest sales, but we're going to be doing it as we print the individual sales amount for each sales order for each customer. So that's where it kind of gets interesting. That's the kind of thing you want to be doing with window functions of course. You're getting that uh, individual, but you're also able to see forwards and backwards. And for making this readable, more easy to read, I'm going to sort it by customer key and sales amount. So here we see customer C. Customer key is 11000. Let's assume that's me. So Brian's bought something in 2013. And like Brian would probably do, he spent a whole whopping $4.99. And here it is. That's his lowest sale within this partition. Let's say partition by. So within his for him, that is his lowest sales amount, okay? But we can see here, his maximum, his highest sale is 3,393.99 cents. So we can't see that at this row, but we now know that's gonna be his highest sale. Then Brian bought something for $21.98. This was still his lowest sale, and this is his highest. So we can kind of just keep going down. And here's where, again, a control break happens, 11000. And we can see here, yep, that is his highest sale. So here's his lowest, and then here's his highest again. So you see this, that's his last row. Then we get into another customer, and this customer happens to also start with 499, but you can see in this case, they go higher, right? They're at 3374.99, so that's what they do. And you can go on and on, and each time when you hit something where there's a control break, this will be the total for them this starts the next one and you can see it begins all over again. So that's pretty cool, very common use case for something like this. And one of the things I wanted to demonstrate here is that you can actually do two different things together. I'm doing the minimum and the maximum and I'm actually using two different window functions in the same single query. Pretty riveting, right? Now let's take a look at another type of thing we can do called end tile. Let me explain a little bit what I mean by end tile because I actually had to step back and look at this a little bit. I don't use this very much. But what you would probably be familiar with if you do data science, you do any kind of statistical analysis, envision this, this standard normal curve distribution, right? You have the beginning and then it goes up and it gets, it gets high in the middle and drops again on the other end. So it's this sort of normal hump. And if it's normally distributed, then it has this sort of systematic pattern that's uh, equally distributed. We'll say over, oh, it gets densest in the middle for frequency. Okay. If you were to divide that into fourths, it is so common to do that. You'd actually, and there's a, there's a function called quartile. And the idea with quartile is find the markers, distribute it from high to low, these values, all the values, just list them from high to low, and then find 
the you can find the midpoint or you can find the quarter point. So divide it into fourths. So take the number of values and just distribute, just slice down this uh, set of values in fourths. And where you find each divider, that would be called quartile. So very common function, you use a lot in statistics, great. But maybe you wanted something a little more powerful. You wanted to use a window function, but you want to have any number you want to divide it by. So they call that n tile. And here, we're going to break up a product into 40 uh, equally distributed subsets by value. And as I mentioned, it's like a quartile. So let's look at how this looks. I'll, I'll show you the results first, make it easier. We're doing this, we're going to do this by standard product cost. We're going to sort out the product list by the product standard cost. So the lowest price product standard cost is $1.49. And not surprisingly, that falls in within the forced. And you can see, and it keeps going up. Then we have the third. And I did this like a really large number, so it would you could see the different tiles coming up. And we could save this, and then we have the way it's distributed. We could use it for charting. We can use it for sampling. We can use it however we want. Uh, but it gives us a nice analysis of where the values are falling in the distribution. All right, so let's look at the query for this. Again, typical SQL statements, pretty standard here. Now, standard cost unfortunately came up as, I believe, a string because I had some nulls in there, little text strings. So I'm casting it here as a decimal so that I can correct that problem and calling it standard cost. The other is just product key, in, uh, English product name is product, etc. And here I'm just using dim product. The big thing here is this function n tile, right, 40. So that's my function. That's going to work within the window function. I'm not going to partition in this case. I'm just going to, because I'm actually only doing this, I think there's only one set of data. I want to do it over the entire data set. I'm going to say order by, and again, I'm going to cast that da, 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 by decimal, uh, but cast this over. What is happening here? I'm running the end tile over the window function ordered by standard cost. And the net result is that I'm doing this end tile over the entire data set, but ordered by standard cost. And here I just have a where clause so that I don't get any of those null or other values in there. To make it easier to see the, the where the end tiles fell, I just order it by the end tile and three, which is this standard cost. So wrapping up, we talked about what are window functions. And we learned that they're a very interesting and powerful feature that extends SQL's capabilities to allow us to look at sort of subsets of data, we call the frame, and different ways. And we can do all kinds of interesting queries like moving around within this frame of rows and getting other values or doing cumulative totals or doing what we saw the end tile. So we saw a lot of different use cases. But the number one thing is that you've kind of got this general overall auto query going on. And the window functions let us kind of do subsetting and kind of interesting queries within that. And we looked at a, a number of different use cases, which I've kind of already iterated. But uh, we talked about doing the end, the t end tile, being able to look at the minimum and maximum amounts within a given group, et cetera, as we go through. I would not expect you to use these all the time. I personally don't use them a lot, but I would say know about them. Be aware of the functionality. One of the big dangers in coding, especially if you're new to like data engineering and querying, is that you end up reinventing the wheel. You do a lot of hard work to do something that's been done before. It's important to know your tool set, know what's available, because otherwise you'll be reinventing a window function and doing a lot of convoluted SQL, which only to have someone say, oh, Brian, why don't you just use this window function? Two lines of code. You know, you don't want to have that happen to you. Don't be that guy. <laughs> anyway, uh, so that's the deal with window functions. I hope this was useful, helpful. Put a comment in if you think it was useful for you. Please like the video share, let people know about this because I like to see people getting a lot of value and I can see it is helping people. Keep following. Tell me you like it. I'll keep going and uh, let me know what you think. Till next time, I'm Paul and Fire. We're all in this together. Thanks.